Usually when reading works from times gone by, we expect a degree of flowery language or turns of phrase that are no longer used, which give the work a certain level of mystique. This is not the case for poet William McGonagall, who lived from 1825 to 1902 and is now regarded as the worst poet in history. Let me explain how. Pathos is a literary technique that evokes strong emotion in the reader by creating a sense of empathy, sympathy or sadness in emotionally charged characters or situations. It's often used to make an audience feel a deep connection to the story and its characters, leading to a more profound emotional impact. Bathos, on the other hand, is a literary technique that creates comedy in what should be a serious moment, usually with a sudden shift in tone. Writers may intentionally make use of bathos to set up a seemingly emotional scene, only to reveal an unexpected punchline. Once upon a time, ships from all over the world used to sail in here. The water used to be covered with a film of oil, and when the sun shone on it, it sparkled with all different colours. When I was a kid, I used to think rainbows lived in the water. So you was a bit of a divvy in them days and all, were you? <laughs> Writers may also unintentionally make use of bathos when they were aiming for pathos, making a scene that they intended to be emotionally impactful humorous because the message is so clumsily delivered. You're lying, I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Why are you so hysterical? Do you understand life? Do you? William McGonagall was a master at this, which is a shame because he often wrote poems about tragedies, like the Tay Bridge disaster in which a railway bridge collapsed underneath a passenger train, killing all on board. Beautiful Railway Bridge of the Silvery Tay, alas, I am very sorry to say that 90 lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. Twas about seven o'clock at night, and the wind it blew with all its might, and the rain came pouring down, and the dark clouds seemed to frown, and the demon of the air seemed to say, I'll blow down the bridge at hay. It must have been an awful sight to witness in the dusky moonlight, while the storm fiend did laugh and angry did bray along the railway bridge of the Silvery Tay. O oh, ill-fated bridge of the Silvery Tay, I must now conclude my lay by telling the world fearlessly, without the least dismay, that your central girders would not have given way, at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses. For the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. Not exactly a most touching tribute. You'll probably notice a few flaws in McGonagall's poem. Firstly, 75 people were killed in the disaster, not 90 like the poem states, but that's somewhat forgivable. What's less forgivable is McGonagall's deafness to poetic metaphor, or the fact the meter seems to shift all over the place with little rhythmic consistency. McGonagall's only apparent understanding of poetry was his belief that it needed to rhyme. Alongside his terrible poetry, McGonagall's behavior as a poet was also quite unintentionally funny, and he was seemingly oblivious to his lack of talent, leading to some hilarious incidents throughout his life. William McGonagall was born in 1825 to Irish parents. There's some confusion on whether he was born in Ireland or Scotland, but he was raised in Dundee, Scotland. McGonagall apprenticed to follow his parents' trade as a handloom weaver, putting an end to whatever formal education he may have had. McGonagall prospered as a handloom weaver, but he seemed to miss his education and took to educating himself by reading English literature. He would entertain his shopmates by reciting Shakespeare and even performed in a production of Shakespeare's Macbeth as the titular character, although it seems either he or his shopmates paid the theatre for this role. The story of Macbeth traditionally ends with Macbeth's well-deserved death at the hands of Macduff, although McGonagall had somehow become convinced that the actor playing Macduff was jealous of him and was attempting to upstage him. For this reason, McGonagall refused to die in the final act, for which history has awarded him the title of Worst Macbeth. You'd think a man that doesn't understand that Macbeth has to die at the end of Macbeth shouldn't become a poet, and yet... 
1877, at the age of 53, McGonagall and his wife were shocked to discover their eldest daughter had given birth to an illegitimate child, bringing shame to the family. Assumedly not wanting to be upstaged again, McGonagall decided to bring even greater shame to the family by becoming a poet. He actually doesn't really explain why he suddenly decided to start writing poetry at the age of 53, other than he was overcome with a strange feeling that compelled him to write. Sir Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn beat the English in every wheel and turn and made them fly in great dismay from off the field without delay. King Edward brought numerous wagons in his train, expecting that most of the Scottish army would be slain, hoping to make the rest prisoners and carry them away in wagon loads to London without delay. The Scottish army did not amount to more than 30,000 strong, but Bruce had confidence he'd conquer his foes ere long. So to protect his little army, he thought it was right to have deep dug pits made in the night. Then King Edward ordered his horsemen to charge, 30,000 in number, it was very large. They taught to overwhelm them ere they could rise from their knees, but they met a different destiny which did them displease. For the horsemen fell into the spiked pits in the way, and with broken ranks and confusion they all fled away. But few of them escaped death from the spiked pits, for the Scots with their swords hacked them to bits. <laughs> De Valence was overthrown and carried off the field. Then King Edward, he thought, it was time to yield. And he uttered a fearful cry to his gay archers nearby. Ho, archers, draw your arrows to the head, and make sure to kill them dead. Forward, without dread, and make them fly. St. George for England be our cry. Then the Scots charged them with sword in hand, and made them fly from off their land. And King Edward was amazed at the sight. And he got wounded in the fight, and he cried, Oh heaven, England's lost and I'm undone. Alas, alas, where shall I run? Then he turned his horse and rode on afar, and never halted till he reached Dunbar. In 1878, McGonagall wrote a poem to Queen Victoria asking for her patronage. He received a letter of rejection that thanked him for his interest. McGonagall took this as high praise of his work, and despite the fact the letter was obviously written by some worker at the palace, took to calling himself the Queen's Poet and would tell people Her Majesty personally approved of his poetry. That year he set out on foot on a 60 mile journey from Dundee to the Queen's residence at Balmoral castle. Although the weather was beautiful when he left, it quickly turned to a thunderstorm and he got drenched. When he reached the castle, he presented his letter with the royal seal to the guards and asked to perform for the queen. He was turned away and had to walk all the way back. His attempt at securing Queen Victoria's patronage was spurred by his struggles with money as he found difficulty in selling his poems. He would often recite his poetry in public, which sometimes resulted in him being pelted with stones or vegetables. Although he claimed most of the time his poetry brought people great delight. Some of his poems dealt with the evils of drinking, something that doesn't seem like it would get a great reception among the general public. O oh, thou demon drink, thou fell destroyer, thou curse of society and its greatest annoyer. What hast thou done to society, let me think. I answer, thou hast caused the most of ills, thou demon drink. Thou causeth the mother to neglect her child, also the father to act as he were wild, so that he neglects his loving wife and family dear by spending his earnings foolishly on whiskey, rum and beer. And after spending his earnings foolishly, he beats his wife, the man that promised to protect her during life. And so the man would if there was no drink in society, for seldom a man beats his wife in a state of sobriety. Okay. And if he does, perhaps he finds his wife foo. Then that causes no doubt a great hullabaloo. When he finds his wife drunk, he begins to frown. And in a fury of passion, he knocks her down. And in that knockdown, she fractures her head. And perhaps the poor wife, she is killed dead. Whereas if there was no strong drink to be got, to be killed wouldn't have been the poor wife's lot. 
Bizarrely, McGonagall decided the pubs would be a good place to recite these poems. You'd think the patrons would be rather annoyed at someone coming in judging them, but assumedly they were greatly entertained by the downright badness of the poetry because this proved very popular, although some of the pub owners weren't too happy. Being used to rowdy crowd reactions, McGonagall joined a local circus where he would perform his poetry while the crowd was permitted to pelt him with food. Funnily enough, this was lucrative work for McGonagall as he seemed to have a great talent for making people want to pelt him. Actually, he was a bit too good at it as these events became so raucous that the city magistrates were forced to ban them. McGonagall was outraged. Fellow citizens of Bonnie Dundee, are ye aware how the magistrates have treated me? Nay, do not stare or make a fuss, when I tell ye they have boycotted me from appearing in Royal Circus, which in my opinion is a great shame, and a dishonour to the city's name. Fellow citizens, I consider such treatment to be very hard. Tis proof for me they have little regard, or else in the circumstances they would have seen to my protection. Then that would have been a proof of their affection, and how genius ought to be rewarded, but instead my genius has been disregarded. Why should the magistrates try and punish me in such a cruel form? I never heard the like since I was born. Fellow citizens, they have taken from me a part of my living, and as Christians, they should have been given. But instead of that, they have prevented Baron Ziegler from engaging me, which is certainly a disgrace to Bonnie Dundee. No more shall the roughs of Bonnie Dundee get the chance of insulting or throwing missiles at me, for I'm going off to the beautiful west, to the fair city of Glasgow that I like best, where the river Clyde rolls on to the sea, and the lark and the blackbird whistles with glee, and your beautiful bridges across the river Clyde, and on your bonnie banks I'm going to reside. Despite ending this poem with a promise to leave Dundee for Glasgow, this lasted less than a month after finding the climate did not agree with him. In 1893, he wrote another poem threatening to leave Dundee over the people's mistreatment of him. This prompted his critics to note he'd probably stay for at least another year once he realised Dundee rhymes with 1893. In response to one such critic, McGonagall wrote probably one of his best poems. Dear Johnny, I return my thanks to you, but more than thanks is your due for publishing the scurrilous poetry about me leaving the ancient city of Dundee. The rhymester says we'll weary for your shockland form, but if I'm not mistaken, I've seen bonnier than his in a field of corn, and as I venture to say, and really suppose, his form seen in a cornfield would frighten the crows. But dear Johnny, as you said, he's just a lampoon, and as ugly and as ignorant as a wild baboon, and as far as I can judge or think, he is a vendor of strong drink. Shortly after, McGonagall received a letter claiming to be from the representatives of King Tebaw Min of Burma. The king was apparently very fond of his poetry, and thus decided to knight him as Sir Topaz McGonagall, Grand Knight of the Holy Order of the White Elephant Burma. The more well-read among you will notice this is a reference to the Canterbury Tales, in which the tale of Sir Topaz and his foe Sir Oliphant is intentionally poorly constructed in comparison to the rest of the tales and its telling is never finished before being interrupted by another character who says, Thy drasty rhyming is not worth a turd. Despite the fact this letter was an obvious hoax, McGonagall would refer to himself as Sir William Topaz McGonagall, Knight of the White Elephant Burma, in his advertising for the rest of his life. McGonagall was seemingly completely oblivious as to the fact his work was largely considered a joke, and he rarely exhibited any acknowledgement of criticism or negative opinion of his poems. Some historians have speculated William McGonagall may have been on the autistic spectrum. Others believe he may have been more aware of what he was doing than he let on and played into the character others perceived him to be, although this is not a widely held viewpoint and seems unlikely. He has gone on to be regarded as the worst poet in history, writing about 200 poems which are considered to be among the worst in English literature. William McGonagall struggled with his finances throughout his poetic career and he was largely supported by friends. He died in poverty in 1902 and was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave. His infamy in the world of poetry has led to him becoming one of Scotland's most popular poets. 
But death could not hold him in the grave, because he died poor sinner souls to save. And God his Father took him to heaven on high, and those that believe in Jesus shall never die. Quite a sad end for someone who provided such entertainment for so many, regardless of if the nature of that entertainment was not quite intended. Hopefully this video will bring his poetry to a new audience of hundreds of thousands of people, and hopefully you'll have enjoyed his work. If you enjoyed the video, let me be clear. To see more in the future that draws most near, you should subscribe in a manner most hasty. And if you still hunger for videos so tasty, I urge ye watch more from my back catalogue, which is large and growing like a big fat dog. Twas on a stormy night, and Boreas blew a bitter blast, and the snowflakes they fell thick and fast, when a poor old mendicant, tired and footsore, who had travelled that day fifteen miles and more, knocked loudly at the rich man's door. The rich man was in his parlour counting his gold, and he ran to the door to see who was so bold, and there he saw the mendicant shivering with the cold. Be gone, you vagabond, from my door. I never give lodgings to the poor. So be off, take to your heels and run, or else I'll shoot you with my gun. Now do not think I'm making fun. Do you hear, old beggar, what I say? Now be quick and go away. Then the old mendicant did go away, and murmuring to himself did say, Oh, woe's me that ever I was born. Oh, God, protect me from the storm. My feeble limbs refuse to go and my poor heart does break with woe. Then he lay down and died among the snow.